And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth had been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And there are seven kings. Five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind, and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will, and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast, until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Hello, YouTube. Hello, everybody. This is another edition of the Divine Program of the World's History. A little book by Albert's Close uh, written in the uh, spirit of the Protestant Truth Society, uh, shortly after the turn of the, what would that be, the 19th to 20th century in the year 19, what? 16. 16 or so, yes. So and here we are in the 21st century, and we are looking back on this work, and it's... Uh, Many, many, many points, and uh, we are in the section right now dealing with European history, the divine program of the European history, and it's the second portion of the book, and I'm gathered here with Yerk Glissman and Daryl Eberhardt, and we are going to continue after our discussion of St. Patrick that we did last time, and uh, yeah, so we'll start with Daryl. Daryl, good morning, and welcome. Good to be on with both of you again and doing a reading here. I don't know how much we'll get into it because I do have a few opening comments because I've found a bunch of my books that I've been looking for that were buried in the basement, the breezeway, piled to the ceiling in my living room, and my living room is starting to look like it used to with books piled 
a foot and a half to two feet high all around my computer, so I can hardly get to my computer anymore. But uh, I had mentioned to uh, both of you before about these books that I've been finding um, that deal with this big problem that is really big in my area, big, big, big in my area, in southwest central Pennsylvania, of all this uh, sexual abuse within the Roman Catholic Church, especially by the religious, which means, you know, like friars and monks and nuns are all classified as the religious. And, of course, many, many... Uh, art, uh, articles have appeared in the two local newspapers uh, in my area, in the Johnstown Altoona Diocese, uh, about uh, uh, epidemic, an epidemic of uh, uh, priestly sexual abuse, uh, mostly of uh, boys and uh, very young men, but uh, the homosexuality is, is epidemic rampant within uh, the ranks of the the priesthood of the Roman Catholic Church, not just in my local area, but it's big here in southwest central Pennsylvania. Again, the Altona Johnstown Diocese. And uh, one of the books I found, and I'm not going to get into any book reports or anything, uh, Yerk, uh, I uh, had sent uh, an email, and he said he's uh, already translated it, I think, into German. But uh, I found one of my uh, uh, other books about uh, the sexual priestly sexual abuse, and it's called Sex, Priests, and Secret Codes, the Catholic Church's 2,000-year paper trail of sexual abuse, and I'm looking at the, it's part of my, one of my uh, working aids, I call them, about uh, uh, good book recommendations, and I'm not going to read it, but I, want, I do want a, a quotation that I found in the book that I thought is very, very telling on pages. I'm trying to get my computer to behave here. Uh, from pages 273 and 274 of that book that I just mentioned. And it, that quotation, it's a short quotation, but it's so true. It says, few bishops have sought forgiveness for their neglect, their blindness to the real harm done to their victims, their collusion in covering for abuse of priests, their preference for preserving the church's image, I added the words to the churches, but for their preference for preserving image over the protection of their flock and their unwillingness to assure the celibate practice of their priests. The hierarchy of the U.S. Catholic Church has yet to produce a bishop or a priest with a fraction of the moral leadership that the late Archbishop Oscar Romero exercised in El Salvador. By the way, Oscar Romero went up against the Jesuits there, and uh, there's a movie out about him that's a very uh, good movie. It's just called uh, Romero, I believe, Oscar Romero, Archbishop in El Salvador. He got gunned down with an M16 by a right-wing hit squad guy, um, and that's quite a story in a, a just of itself. But I just wanted to get, read that quote and Can mention the fact... Can I just interrupt you there, Daryl? Sure. I was doing a little bit of research today, a little bit, because I translated that description that you are giving here into German. And I was reading on Wikipedia on, these, uh, on, on this archbishop, uh, Romero, because I found it very interesting um, that he was mentioned there. Um, but it was not mentioned what he did. So I thought, well, I'm going to look him up. And I wanted to have a picture of him in this book, the picture that you just saw here in the video. I mean, you didn't see it, but the people saw it who watched the video. And um, I read all through the Wikipedia article, which is quite long, and it didn't say anything, anything about what he did to or against child abuse within the Roman Catholic Church. Isn't that strange? Because I was looking that up and I thought, well, there must be something about it. There was mentioning something about, quote-unquote, dirty war, and he was doing charity and this and that. But there was nothing said against a, quote-unquote, fight or whatever against child abuse. So, just... No, I don't know just, if... I don't no, know if I, I, go ahead. I just want to fill up to what you are saying. To when the people go out into the internet and, for example, go to Wikipedia and look this Archbishop Romero from uh, San Salvador up, the story that you just told about how he was killed and that he was killed by a gun squad 
a, a major or something that was it who pulled the trigger who was quote unquote from the right wing well that's of course all the uh, all the information you get from wikipedia that's of course all the way that they like to put it you know right wing left wing paradigm um that's what they love to do but you don't get any deep information about the work of this archbishop who maybe was really even in biblical terms a saint um, because that's what, how he is mentioned in this book that you are saying. I just wanted to intervene that little stuff because I just read about it today. You know, this is how the spirit works. I didn't know you were bringing right. this, this subject up today. So, well, but I want we to share this. Op- so please go on. Yeah, we may have opened a can of worms here because number one is uh, Oscar Romero. He was like Pope John Paul I, uh, Albino Luciani, who was... Uh, uh, we believe murdered uh, a book by David Yollop in God's name uh, makes an extremely almost an airtight case uh, that he died under very extremely let's put it extremely suspicious uh, circumstances a very fortuitous uh, um, premature death for the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church because uh, Albino Luciani uh, Pope John uh, Paul I uh, was getting ready to clean house in the Vatican. Uh, he, I think he had seen a list in, uh, uh, I think it was Politico Observatory or something, but one of those Italian newspapers had a list. I think there was something like a hundred, over 100, maybe 121 names of people within the Roman Curia, high-ranking Roman Catholic prelates, including, including a number of cardinals, uh, who belonged to P2 Masonry. Now, some people may think, oh, no, uh, Masonry and uh, the Roman Catholic Church are opposed to each other. No, a lot of high-level Roman Catholic prelates are uh, P2 Masons and probably other different Masons, but the, the fact of the matter is he was getting ready to, uh, as we had mentioned before, Pope John Paul I was getting ready to send into exile, if you would, Think of like if he was a, a Russian pope instead of a, an Italian pope. But Albino Luciani was getting ready to send these guys into Siberian exile, if we would make an analogy to uh, people living in the old Soviet Union. He was getting ready to send these guys to lower Slobovia and the far uh, reaches of the uh, Soviet gulag system, if we're making a comparison and analogy. But the, the fact of the matter is he was taking these guys out of key power positions within the Roman Catholic Church and within the Roman Curia, um, the, the guys that uh, help the Pope run uh, the Vatican, Jesuit-controlled papal Rome. But jo- Pope John Paul I died under very mysterious con- circumstances, and uh, his, he was in very good health. Uh, his doctors uh, reported that, and uh, very vigorous and uh, doing quite well. But just, I guess, just it was just coincidental that just as he's getting ready to clean house and get uh, rid of a bunch of these high-level people within the Roman Curia, he he dies suddenly, and and uh, they don't allow an autopsy. And, and I had to urge people to uh, uh, read the very thick book in God's name by David Yollop, and you'll see that uh, uh, they certainly had the motive to uh, off him, as to use the term, uh, to uh, assassinate him. They wanted to get rid of him. Oscar Romero is a very interesting character. There's a, I've seen the movie. I have it. I would urge you people to watch it, uh, if you can, uh, watch that movie, if, especially if it's free up there on the Internet. It's called uh, Romero, I think, is just, they use his last name as the title of, uh, it's more of a, I guess it's a a movie documentary, but it uh, gets into Oscar Romero, and he he was sick and tired. Um, I started to say he was a bookworm, like uh, Albino Luciani. So, like when Albino Luciani got in, um, kind of a compromise candidate for Pope, uh, um, some of the top people in Roman Curia figured Albino Luciani, he's going to be an easy guy. He's a bookworm. He's no problem. He's no threat. We can control him very easily. Well, the same thing was said about Oscar Romero. When Oscar Romero uh, was a, uh, 
got the, became a bishop in that, and then he got that, the archbishop position in El Salvador. They looked at him and they thought, they even show in the movie that a couple of Jesuits talking, oh, he's a bookworm, he's a milk toast, he'll, we can control this guy, he'll be real easy to handle. Well, Romero didn't like the fact that uh, one of his uh, uh, priests that under him got murdered. Uh, by these uh, right-wing death squads, and these squads are, oh, they're just, well, they're epidemic and have been epidemic in places, regimes like Argentina, but uh, in other regimes in Latin America, where, like in El Salvador, where they were going around killing anybody and everybody that didn't fit into the plans of the right-wing government and the church, which were locked in lockstep together, marching together in... Uh, having people disappear, uh, people, well, in Argentina, I think they were flying them out into the ocean and tossing them out of helicopters, uh, anybody that opposed the church or the government, church and state, was uh, gotten rid of, disappeared, never got heard of again. And it reminded me of the old Soviet Union where people would get into the gulag system of labor camps and uh, slave camps and that where they never heard of them again, never where they got tortured, where they were allowed to uh, freeze to death, where they were allowed to starve to death. Uh, it just reminds me of uh, these stories. And then uh, to see that uh, Oscar Romero was speaking out against these right-wing death squads that were running around murdering people, kidnapping people, including children, torturing women and children big time, and Oscar Romero started speaking out about it, and these guys, like the couple Jesuits there and that, they started saying, oh, wait a second, this guy, a, he's a bookworm. He isn't supposed to do this. He's, he's supposed to keep his mouth shut. He's supposed to be a good little boy and be a milk toast, and, and we'll warn him and, and tell him to keep his mouth shut. And that didn't work because Oscar Romero had a little bit of backbone and spine. To, he had a lot of backbone and spine, and he stood up against these crumbs, these uh, dirty murderers and that torturers uh, in El Salvador, and uh, because of that, and he wouldn't back down, uh, well, they just made little plans to have, and I think it was a National Guard guy that shot him uh, in the uh, right one of the, a member of the right wing death squads, uh, and I think he was enlisted guy, soldier, uh, walked into the church when, uh, and I know we're not going to get into the doctrinal ends of this, but Oscar Romero was saying Mass in a church, and uh, as he's up there saying Mass, this soldier uh, walks uh, up the center aisle a couple feet and just levels his M16 at the guy and shoots him dead. And we don't know, how, we, we can't give every single example of where these people do that. We, we often talk about how they murder thousands and thousands and tens of thousands and sometimes hundreds of thousands in these different massacres that they've done throughout history, like the Hus, uh, John, Jan Hus and that. These are individuals, but they, they wiped, tried to wipe out the population of Bohemia. They, Christian, the real Bible-believing Christian population, they tried to uh, wipe out uh, the French Huguenots, the French Protestants. In uh, I think it was 1572 was the uh, Saint Bartholomew's Day massacres. Uh, 1641. I'm just going by memory here, folks. Uh, was the slaughter of uh, I think about 150,000 Irish Protestants. Again, where they tortured, and mutilated, they hung women from trees and cut their babies out of their womb. You think this kind of stuff doesn't go on today? Watch the, um, uh, a documentary called The Inquisition or the, the Catholic Inquisition. It happened in Croatia. They were cutting babies out of the mother's wombs while they're still alive, cutting their eyes out, crucifying priests to wooden doors. This is all documented, heavily documented in books like Convert or Die, uh, Avro Manhattan and Edmund Paris and his book, uh, the Secret History of the Jesuits that you can get from Chick Publications, uh, by the way, which makes a very good case that uh, Jesuit-controlled papal Rome fomented both World War I and World War II. But back to the subject of the sex, priestly sexual abuse and that. I found a number of my books, and one of those books, and I think I've found at least six or eight now here recently that I picked up, and 
It's called, again, the Sex, Priests, and Secret Codes, the Catholic Church's 2,000-year paper trail of sexual abuse. And it's by three Roman Catholic authors, folks, three Roman Catholic authors named Thomas P. Doyle, A.W. Richard Seip, and Patrick J. Wall, and one of them is a priest. And they just they get into showing how that the, the Roman Catholic Church has a 2,000-year paper trail of sexual abuse. This was going on um, in monasteries and convents, which often had tunnels between them. Now, the reason I'm bringing all this up is I've got a book right in front of me that Dr. Alberto Rivera supported and got out to people. He publi- had it published called Maria Monk, The Nun That Lives Again. And, of course, they po- uh, poo-pooed this, and they attacked uh, Maria Monk. Uh, I don't know what her real name was. Uh, some of these people take assumed names. But um, it just reminded me how folks have been demonized by papal Rome uh, throughout um, the centuries. But I think of uh, Dr. Alberto Rivera, who they believe was poisoned. His wife believes he was poisoned. And then, of course, the Roman Catholic Church went after him, and I'm, I'm going to give you just a, a few people's names, but they can't, they can't deal with truth. So what the, the Roman Catholic Church resorts to is what they call ad hominem, which is a Latin phrase, you know, you go after the person, you go after their character, you go after their reputation. You can't dispute them because you're going to lose every time because they'll knock your, well, they'll knock your socks off. With their uh, because they'll have they have truth on their side. So all, all that they can resort to are lies, innu- innuendos, and ad hominem attacks. And they all of these people that I'm just going to mention here: Dr. Alberto Rivera, Jack T. Chick, uh, the godly uh, pastor Charles Chinicky, uh Maria Monk, the nun. There, there was another nun, Sister Charlotte. They used to have her testimony up on the internet. These people's testimonies all agree, by the way. So if you say, oh, no, this Maria Monk, she never really existed. The Catholic Church came out and said, oh, she was in an asylum. She was never a nun. And that's all they can do is tell lies, innuendos, and do ad hominem attacks. But they can't, they can't stand toe-to-toe with anyone that has the truth on them. They can't debate the truth. They have to say, oh, that person never really existed, or, or they weren't like in Dr. Alberto Rivera's case. Oh, he was never a Jesuit. There's, you know, but there's books out there that have pictures of him with his ID card. And uh, we poor people are not as sophisticated as the CIA and the Knights of Malta, the Jesuit-controlled CIA and the Jesuit-controlled Knights of Malta. We can't buy all kinds of expensive equipment and make fake papers like they can and do. No, that's what they do is, is they make up phony identifications and stuff like that. We don't have the money and we don't have the time and we don't have the expertise to do that. And so I'm telling you, Dr. Alberto Rivera was real. Everything I have about probably 40 or 50 books, at least maybe 60 or 70 uh, on the Jesuits and the history of the Jesuits, many by Europeans, and everything that Dr. Alberto Rivera, who was supported by Jack T. Chick, everything that Dr. Alberto Rivera said about the Jesuits is true 100%, because it all works together and it corroborates everything else is corroborated that he said by other people, and some of them were ex-Jesuits also that came out and wrote histories and that and again a lot of them we owe our thanks to the europeans because a lot of the italians french germans especially and british have written about the jesuits and their nefarious sinister sneaky crafty history you're saying you're picking on the poor jesuits they're great educators uh, I won't deny that they're great educators I I won't they're great uh, mind control people also um, but I won't deny that they're great uh, or infamous uh, father confessors to uh, women. Um, but again, Dr. Alberto Rivera, Jack T. Chick, Charles Chinicky, all, all of them, their characters were attacked. Uh, we call it character assassination, and they did the same thing with Maria Monk and Sister Charlotte. And again, if you Google those 
folks' names, Maria Monk or Sister Charlotte, you're going to find testimonies that uh, are still to this day denied. And by the way, I'll get back to the point I was going to make, and that is, despite this epidemic, and some of these priests and monks and friars, uh, each, uh, some of them have up to 100, uh, shall we say, scalps uh, to their record. In other words, uh, notches on their guns um, of people that they abuse. Can you get that? One priest or one monk or one friar having 100 young men or boys on his notches on his pistol, if you would of sexually abusing them. Now do the math. We've had over, I think, I think there's something like over a hundred priests have been, had the finger put on them and not, here's the point I want to get at. And this is an important point to make. Not a single one of them, to the best of my knowledge, here in southwest central Pennsylvania in the Johnstown Altona uh, Diocese, not one of them has gone to jail. They have drugged their feet on all of these things. They still, in Pennsylvania state legislature, they're still trying to get the statute of limitations removed so they can go after some of these priests. They can't even, in the state of Pennsylvania, they can't get enough votes, no matter how, because the, the Catholic bishops especially uh, oppose this 100%, and there's no way they're going to let these legislators uh, in the Pennsylvania legislation, they're not going to let them pass anything that drops that uh, statute of limitations because, uh, well, not that any of it is ever really going to go to court because, uh, like I said, they've, they've had a couple of these Franciscan prelates uh, that went to other states that were in charge of the, uh, I think his name was Brother Baker, but people can probably do a Google search on that, but there was a guy up here in southwest central Pennsylvania that was accused of uh, molesting, I think it's over 100 boys in one of the Roman Catholic high schools in this area. <clears throat> and, of course, he, uh, he never came to trial. Um, he had a couple stab wounds in his heart, and some of us surmise that a couple uh, hefty Jesuits or Franciscans, we don't know, we're surmising, but that came into his room and he was at one of the mon- staying at one of the monasteries and uh, they wanted to bring the guy up on charges and I think we think that uh, a couple guys big hefty strong guys probably former football players or something like that or wrestlers walked in and said brother baker it's time for you to fall on your butcher knife well actually we have two butcher knives here and we'd like you to fall on them or something they might have been, might have been too, but I think he had two stab wounds to the heart or something, and and uh, he was told that it's time to fall on your sword, just like King Saul uh, in the Bible fell on his sword. It's time for you to fall on your sword because uh, we don't want you getting into a courtroom. Uh, but most of them, most of them never see a courtroom because uh, we had the the one Monsignor here in this area when we had Bishop Adamek was running. Um, actually a couple counties here, uh, Cambria County and Blair County, uh, this uh, Monsignor, and I'm not going to say his name because I'm, not, I'm going from memory and it's a lot of years ago, but this Monsignor, we had mentioned this in a previous YouTuber, there he is in front of the camera and uh, as being asked about, uh, oh, are you worried that some of these priests are going to go to jail? Uh, and he openly bragged, oh, no, uh, you know, we appoint the sheriffs in these counties. We, we appoint the police chiefs. Uh, you, no one gets appointed to those positions unless they've got our backing, probably in the backing of the Knights of Columbus in this area. But uh, none of them are going to get appointed. Uh, I mean, none of them are going to be prosecuted because, you know, we control uh, the judges. We control uh, law enforcement. You know, this is sad. We're talking about a state in the United States of America, Pennsylvania, where we had a couple newspapers, at least, with the guts to go after uh, this horrible cleric epidemic, this virus, uh, this plague. uh, But it is an epidemic, a rampant epidemic of priestly sexual abuse of boys and young men 
And um, despite all of the efforts of the, the newspapers in exposing it, uh, how come none of them are in jail? If the, any of us, like uh, my brother Brett there lives in Minnesota, if, if he in Minnesota or me in Pennsylvania, if we go out and run over children with our cars or something, you know what, we're going to jail. But these people do worse. And nothing happens to them because uh, they're part of the, they have like diplomatic immu- immunity. They belong to the, uh, the Holy See. They, they belong to a, they have a citizenship in a different country. Uh, they have diplomatic immunity from prosecution. Don't you know? Because they are not only citizens of Pennsylvania or let's say Minnesota, because Minneapolis St. Paul has had a big problem too up there with this kind of stuff, but they're also citizens of the Holy See, of Papal Rome. And that citizenship takes priority over their United States citizenship. It takes priority over their citizenship or whatever membership and being in like in Pennsylvania as a Commonwealth of Pennsylvania or in the state of Minnesota. It takes precedence over everything because if you are a Roman Catholic priest or monk or nun or anything and uh, you are in one of these other states or commonwealths or or in a country like the United States of America, well, (laughs) your uh, papal citizenship uh, takes priority over. And so people talk about some Jews that have, oh, let's say they're, uh, citizens of the United States and Israel, and people go, oh, oh, how horrible, how horrible, dual citizenship. Make up your mind, do you want to be an American or do you want to be, uh, you know, an Israeli? Well, what about people that belong to papal Rome, Jesuit-controlled papal Rome, and have a dual citizenship? How about them making up their minds, whether they want to be under the Holy See, under uh, the papacy, under Jesuit-controlled papal Rome, uh, or do they want to be a citizen of the United States of America? And we had a lot of courageous people that have written about this. Samuel Morrison, uh, we've mentioned a bunch of other ones on this broadcast. Uh, uh, John Dowling, uh, uh, just I think his name was Justin Dewey Fulton, but uh, a lot of people writing back in the 1800s were warning people, uh, watch out, these heavy waves of uh, immigration from Roman Catholic countries are designed for a reason, and it is to Romanize the United States of America. And boy, not only did it happen, like here in my area, and I have a lot of Roman Catholic friends, so this isn't Catholic bashing. I love a lot of my Roman Catholic friends. In my area, southwest central Pennsylvania, was heavily settled by a lot of good-hearted Roman Catholics from Poland, from Ireland, and from Germany. There's a lot of German Catholics came into my area in southwest central Pennsylvania, a lot of Irish Catholics, Polish Irish and German uh, were many of them good, hard-working people. Uh, a lot of them hard-drinking people, because <laughs> my area has a, a lot of these folks in them. But uh, believe me, um, uh, I love many individual Roman Catholics. But this epidemic of clerical sexual abuse of uh, boys and young men and women, we need to add that because we mentioned in a previous YouTuber that tremendous book by William H. Kennedy, Lucifer's Lodge, Satanic Ritual Abuse in the Catholic Church. That's a Roman Catholic writer who probably died a premature death, by the way. He and about three or four other men that were writing, all of them were writing about the the priestly sexual abuse within the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, All of them were threatened and warned to back off, and we believe at least three or four of them were murdered. Uh, we're given, a, given suspicious, mysterious deaths. I'm getting tired of it, and I think that, that my brother, Christian brothers are too. We're getting tired of them not only assassinating people through character assassination, but also literally murdering them as they did Al, uh, Dr. Alberto Rivera, the ex-Jesuit. He was a Jesuit, as um, uh, the book is Alberto for Real. 
uh, very, I think that was Sidney Hunter. And again, I'm going totally by memory here, sitting in the midst of all of my books here. So guys, I guess I may be opened a can of worms again, and but this all ties together. And with what Yerk's been talking about and uh, running uh, a YouTube uh, sessions, I believe also in German and Dutch and mentioning this problem, it's epidemic. It's not just epidemic in my area, southwest central Pennsylvania. It's all over Europe and the United States, and I'm sure it's big in Latin America, too, of this sexual abuse of of boys and women. And it's interesting, William H. Kennedy, he wrote uh, the book again, Lucifer's Lodge, Satanic Ritual Abuse in the Catholic Church. He made the statement that, wow, you know, I started to write my book about the pedophile priest, the abuse problem in the United States. But he says, the more I investigated, the more I noticed that maybe the, the abuse of women and girls is even bigger than the abuse of uh, boys and uh, young men. So think about that one for a second. And, of course, we've mentioned before the books that were written about the confessional, how that leads to all kinds of problems. And I think that's something Yerk can probably speak very well to, too, is um, the priest, the woman in the confessional. Charles Chinicky wrote that book, and you can get that through uh, Chick Publications, chick.com. The, pre- the priest, the woman in the confessional, tremendous book showing about how they, uh, they were trained, these Roman Catholic priests to ask young girls, teenage girls, and women sexual questions. And uh, that's something, Yerk, that I would imagine you might want to talk about a little bit because you've looked into that. This Laguerre and the uh, uh, other Catholic fathers that came up with all these questions in Latin, uh, but of course they, the, that's one like, thing that they will speak in the vernacular is they will ask these people in the confessional these questions. And again, I ask, as I've asked some of my Roman Catholic friends, and I have many of them growing up in this area, I said, how can you let your wife and or your daughter go confess her deepest secrets, her sexual thoughts, because these guys are trained to probe and ask questions about their sexual activities. And you're going to let your wife, your daughter, your sister in the flesh go to this man, this celibate man, and tell her deepest secrets, sexual thoughts to, and he's going to probe her like he's an interrogator? because you're supposed to get a good, clean confession out of them. And I hear some people say, oh, most Catholics don't go to confession anymore. There's still a fair amount that do. And as a matter of fact, it used to be a mortal sin if you didn't go to confession at least once a year. And in other places, uh, they uh, kind of uh, put a lot of pressure on you to go a whole heck of a lot more often than once a year. So... um, Guys, I opened a can of worms here. Do I, either of you want to jump in and say anything about anything that I've said here? Well, the only thing that I can jump on for the moment right now, Daryl, is on Alfonso Liguori. I read a publication from Robert Grassmann, which is a German, of course, who published in 1937 in the height of the Third Reich, Nazi Roman Catholic Reich in Germany, a book on the moral theology of uh, Alfonso Liguori, which is about 60 pages long. I read that completely in my little German series that I make. Uh, Little, that series is going to be huge, actually. Um, That is called uh, Systematic Catholic Child Abuse, because, as you mentioned, that child abuse within the Roman Catholic Church is something that is very much infested in their rights, in their tradition. It goes to the roots of this Babylonian religion. Yeah, uh, It is systematic. We have all to understand that. So when you are reading books um, on this matter, and these books do not go into the facts that the Roman Catholic Church is a superstitious religion that uses the veneration of pictures and idols like Mary statues and all that stuff, and by there is breaking the second commandment. And when you know, when you read Romans 1, you know very well that the break of the second commandment is a punishment for that you will be uh, uh, 
that will be laid upon you by our Lord the God, um, that you will go, be, uh, that you will be driven into sexual abnormality, most and for all sodomy, and also into child abuse. That is all on the basis of I idol veneration, yeah, um, and that is what the Roman Catholic Church is all about. It's an idolatrous Babylonian religion. Idolatrous because it venerates not only pictures but statues. It venerates gods who are no gods because there's only one god, and all the other ones are made-up gods of stone, of glass, of wood, of whatever plastic you can find. Yeah, there's only one god. And there's only one mediator for God and man, and that's the man Christ Jesus. Let's make that sure, first and for all. Right. And this child abuse within the Roman Catholic Church is systematic. It is on the roots of that religion in the very first place. And whenever you read books that do not address this, and I have never read one book that addresses that that deep, you go to my playlist, if, at least if you speak German, because I made this one in German, Systematischer Katholischer Kindesmissbrauch, means um, Systematic Catholic Child Abuse. And in that, I read this book from Liguori. I just put that picture of Liguori up here, as you saw earlier, here in the midst. Yeah, Liguori was not a Jesuit, but Liguori was Jesuit trained. He founded his own uh, congregation, It is called the Redemptorists. They are still in existence today. The two people, uh, Miller and Auburn, who wrote this book on Saint, quote-unquote, Saint Alphonsus Liguori, who was a doctor of the church, which is one of the highest titles that you can get in the Roman Catholic Church anyway, to be venerated for. Um, these two guys writing this book, they come out of the sea dot ss dot r that is that that means that they are from the brotherhood of the redemptorists that is the order that liguori founded and in times of suppression of the jesuit order in for example the 17th 17th and 18th century in france for example when the jesuits were expelled do you know where they where they hid where they found refuge <laughs> within the redemptorists Yeah? They are very similar orders. Most people don't even know that. Yeah? And this quote-unquote saint, Alphonsus Liguori, doctor of the Roman Catholic Church, wrote a moral theology of the Roman Catholic Church that is still in use today in the education of every new priest who comes to the Roman Catholic Church and who, ha who keeps himself busy with the confessional, as we have the picture here on the left, from the priest, the woman at the confessional, by Charles Chenequi. And everyone who is going to busy himself with that in the Roman Catholic Church has to work through the 7,000 pages of moral theology of St. Alphonsus Liguori. And if you don't do Alphonsus Liguori, then you do Busenbaum or Suarez or other guys. You have so many quote-unquote moral teachers. Why? Because the Roman Catholic Church upholds a moral that is 180 degrees opposite to that what God of the Bible calls moral and morality. And what every normal human being understands of being moral behavior is done away with, with the teachings of people like St. Alphonsus Liguori. And when you understand how the priests are being educated, being trained, being formed within the Roman Catholic Church to ask the right questions at the right moment to the right person, whether it is a young girl, it is a young boy, it is a virgin woman, a young woman, it is a, um, a widow, it is a married woman, it is a, uh, a celibate man, or it is a, a just an unmarried young man or an older man, whoever comes into the confession box, these priests know exactly what questions to ask, and they pull out the most secret and intimate knowledge that you keep for yourself and get that information out of you and then they're going to use it against you and while using it against you they are abusing you they are abusing you physically they are abusing you psychologically they are destroying your soul they are destroying your faith they are destroying everything that you have so that you will not go to Jesus Christ and be saved but will be lost in the world of Satan forever and ever 
people like this quote-unquote saint Alfonso Liguori are an incarnation of the devil, if you ask me. And I read this book from Robert Grassmann, which he published in 1937 in German on that moral theology. I made two of the five or six videos I made out of that uh, age restricted so that only people above 18 years can watch it because sometimes what I had to read there and had to comment on there was too delicate for eyes or for ears of people who are under age. That wa that's why, of course, these videos are not that much popular because many people, when they see, oh, this is age restricted, I don't want to see that, um, they don't go there. But I can tell you it's very interesting. And you can, of course, look Liguori's work up also in English. You can find it on the internet. I think you can find it as a PDF. I didn't look right now, but when I can, if I can find it in German, you can surely find it in English. Because in English we have so much more documentation on this subject all over the world anyway. And then you will understand how systematic that abuse, and not only child abuse, but that abuse within the Roman Catholic Church is. And let me make one more last point. That's also a point that I made in my readings there. We are speaking of child abuse. But don't you understand that every abuse of any man, of any woman on this earth is child abuse? Because we are all children. We are all children of our Heavenly Father in the very first place. So whenever you are abusing a boy, a girl, a puberty, a, a teenager, a young man, a young woman, an old woman, an old man, you are always abusing a child of God. So you're always child abusing, not only with minors, but also with adults. They are all children of God. That is something that is sometimes so easily forgotten. Can you tell me where this moral comes from, please, that you get a child and that you love it and you raise it up and you give it everything you have and love and, and, and respect and devotion and you put it through schools and universities and all that stuff to give it a good education as you think you give it a good education and you let it out in the world and you love that child and the child is protected by the state on every moment until the moment it turns 18. Oh, now it's no child anymore. Now it can go to the military. Now it can die for the Roman pontiff. Don't you see the hypocrisy in that thinking? That from the moment you turn 18 years old, you're not a child anymore? You're always a child of God. And that's what the Roman Catholic Church always abuses to the core. Well, I those are my five, that, five cents yeah. to this, Daryl. Yeah, and, and very good points. Uh, you made that in the last YouTuber also, and it's a great point. And that is, is that God doesn't look at the age. He doesn't care. He, what he cares is that part, parts of his creation are being destroyed. And the height of his creation was the human being. And God doesn't like to see his children sent off to get mowed down in all of these papal-inspired, papal, uh, Jesuit-controlled papal Rome-inspired, choreographed and orchestrated wars. And we pointed out a number of times that these wars, when you read Edmund Paris's book, The Secret History of the Jesuits, he makes a, if he was a lawyer and he was taking that case into an honest court uh, with an honest jury, I don't think he could lose. I think people, even if you had... Nine out of, or I mean, ten out of ten, or twelve out of twelve, whatever the jury size is, uh, uh, being Roman Catholic, if they were honest, they would have to convict the Roman Catholic Church not only of all this uh, sexual abuse within the clerical sexual abuse within the Roman Catholic Church, but they would also have to convict them on fomenting and orchestrating wars that have led to the deaths of millions upon millions upon millions. World War II, I think, alone, 66 million minimum, maybe 70 million. I've seen both figures. Uh, people died premature deaths, many of them women and children and elderly in World War II because of the firebombing of German cities, of, uh, German cities especially in the northern parts, of, of uh, which were the mainly Protestant, so-called, parts Hamburg of Germany. Dresden, yeah. Dresden, yep. And, and Hamburg, 
Yeah, yeah. But I, yeah. I remember. Yeah, I remember sure. from my grandmother when she was still alive. She was a survivor of the firestorm that was there in Hamburg when mm. Hamburg got firebombed, and I think plus seventy-five thousand people died in one night from these fires because there really was a firestorm. That means that the fire yes. went berserk all over the city, destroying everything in its way. And my grandmother even told me, uh, because Hamburg had a very famous zoo, Hagenbeek's, and um, uh, all the wild animals running on the streets, lions, giraffes, uh, hippopotamus, and, uh, and all, these, uh, all these animals, you could see running down the street because it was all bombed down, you know? And uh, in Dresden, uh, with quote-unquote Bomber Harris, uh, he bombed Dresden in, 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 in one night and they killed, they don't admit it, that it was that many, but when you get to the real numbers, they killed about 500,000 people. Most of them were refugees coming from yep. the eastern parts of Prussia, coming from Slesia, Pommern, and, uh, and, and East Prussia, all that stuff, they were fleeing uh, before the Bolshevik army, yeah, and they were going to Dresden for refuge, and when they were there at the refuge, this Bomber Harris, this uh, general or whatever he was from the RAF, did, had not, did nothing else but bomb the shit out of the whole city of Dresden and bombed it to the ground and killed and by that, that at least about mm. 500,000 people. And today... Now, let me show you this picture. You won't believe your eyes. You have in Germany people of this so-called feminine group. Yeah? This is a very uh, militaristic feminist group. And what do they do? They undress themselves and write on their naked body, Bomber Harris, do it again. Vile feminist Mercedes Reichstein calls for second firebombing of innocent men, women and children in Dresden. So here on the one side of the picture you see this feminist putting up her middle finger, of course, writing all over her body, Bamba Harris do it again, and on the other hand you see the mutilated, burned, almost to the ash, uh, burned corpses of Dresden. This is the mentality of the psychotic left. And with this picture, again, what do they do? Divide and conquer. This is the left. Therefore, we have to put again the right. And then we're going to smash them two together. And what comes out of it is our synthesis. That's what they did in World War II so wonderfully, almost perfectly. Almost perfectly, they are using the communist left against the fascist mm -hmm. and national socialist right. And what comes out of it? The European Union of 2019. Isn't that great when you can see through this deception and can see through it all and see who is behind it all? Yeah. And Jörg, a real good point there, and that is, is that the, the bombing with conventional bombs yeah. on cities like Hamburg and Dresden, uh, yeah. where, where, where more people died in those bombings than in the atomic bombs that were dropped allegedly on, because some people think they might have been ground. It doesn't matter, but the, mat, the fact of the matter is, is that more people died in those fire bombings with conventional bombs and uh, a lot of those bombs were incendiary, by the way. They were designed to create big fires in refugee-filled cities, mostly elderly and women and children fleeing to those cities. Uh, more people died there under that conventional bombing than did in the uh, al atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki probably put together. More people died both a cindery, incendiary bombing, and it was designed wave after wave after wave of bombers went over those German cities, and it was designed to kill the maximum amount and or mutilate the maximum amount of people, civilian 
people, men, but mo- mostly elderly women and children. The, the, that's a part of that war that is not talked about because the victors write the history, and we need to remember that. Uh, I just want to mention, since we are on the topic and we've pretty much filled this hour up with that, my, these books I've got, and I picked up probably at least eight or nine or ten books on this topic uh, shortly before my stroke in, uh, uh, let's see, it was been late October of 2017, I'd picked up, and these books are all written by courageous Roman Catholics. Uh, Another book, Lead Us Not Into Temptation, Catholic Priests and the Sexual Abuse of Children, written by Jason Berry, a Roman Catholic. And the, the, the book says in the uh, back cover, in the autumn of 1984, Jason Berry heard reports of the sexual abuse of boys by a priest in rural Louisiana. As an expectant father, he was horrified for the children. As a Catholic, he reasoned that even a priest can commit crimes. As a reporter, he wanted to find out what had happened. In this groundbreaking book, first published in 1992 and still used in many newsrooms, Berry exposed a culture of corrosive secrecy in which bishops concealed a criminal sexual underground. One of Barry's sources accurately projected one billion in church losses by centuries end. Lead Us Not Into Temptation, the book, is a masterful narrative of an epic crisis as it unfolds. The story begins in, he gives it's in one of the Louisiana counties, a, a single priest abused dozens of children. It moves to the Vatican Embassy in Washington, D.C., where a secret pedophilia report warned or warns American bishops of staggering implications if a forthright policy is not soon adopted. Yet pay, cases Keep surfacing New York City, Minneapolis, St. Paul, Chicago, Cleveland, Honolulu, Seattle, New Orleans, there are some people saying New Orleans, and in Canada, as Barry unpills, and that's his word, a web of suffering. In other words, he exposed a web of suffering and struggles for justice. As much about journalism as the cover-up culture, the author exposed a decade before the Boston Globe's major series. This updated edition stands as a fair and fearless portrayal of the Catholic Church's worst crisis in centuries and as a haunting affirmation of faith. Again, Jason Berry, Roman Catholic, lead us not into temptation, Catholic priests and the sexual abuse of children. And then another book, Lucifer's Lodge. I mentioned that, Satanic Ritual Abuse in the Catholic Church by William H. Kenney. That's a 220-page. I still can't find my copy, but it's a paperback book published by Revisimus. It's a Latin word, Revisimus, or whatever. I can't locate my copy, but the, this book not only exposes the massive problem, again, of Roman Catholic priests preying upon, and that's praying, P-R-E-Y-I-N-G, preying upon boys and young men within the Catholic Roman Catholic Church, but it also deals with the tremendous amount of sexual abuse by priests and by the religious, in other words, a member of the community of monks and nuns, of girls and women, including nuns within the Roman Catholic Church. William H. Kennedy, a Roman Catholic, again, a Roman Catholic author, met with an untimely death, as did a number of other individuals who were exposing sexual abuse, especially by priests and prelates within the Roman Catholic Church. This book, I believe Brett found that book, uh, it's available on the Internet in PDF format because it's awful hard to find uh, an old paperback used copy of the book because they're asking a whole bunch of money for it. Uh, but there are, uh, I, I found at least, I'd say, eight to ten good books written by Roman Catholics, courageous Roman Catholics, exposing this epidemic problem within the Catholic Church. And I'm just looking real here uh, through, I've got a working aid that I've created with a lot of good books to recommend. Here's the one, uh, another one, Sacrilege, Sexual Abuse in the Catholic Church by a Roman Catholic. I believe the guy's an investigator, has, was a federal investigator, Leon J. Pottles, P-O-D-L-E-S, Sacrilege, Sexual Abuse in the Catholic Church. Here's what it says for the first time on the back cover. An author skilled in investigations with a knowledge of theology and history surveys and analyzes the crisis of the largest institution in the world. You get that? The largest institution in the world. 
Sacrilege, the book Sacrilege, explores the deep roots of the Catholic Church's sexual abuse scandal, revealing its full depth and breadth. As former federal investigator Leon Pottles documents, abuse is not limited to a few well-publicized cases in New England. It has occurred in every type of Catholic institution in every time period throughout the world. In the United States alone, some of the worst cases of abuse go back to the 1940s, remaining hidden until exposed for the first time in sacrilege. In horrifying yet necessary detail, the book Sacrilege explores the full extent of the damage, showing how victims were failed by bishops, laity, therapists, police, courts, press, and even popes. I gave you the example of my southwest central Pennsylvania here, uh, the two counties, uh, Blair and Cambria counties, and that we've seen so many of these people skate by, and nobody goes to jail. Getting back to the description on the back of the book, it's set, and it's almost done here. Examining the history behind today's headlines, Dr. Pottles reveals how centuries-old theological errors encouraged blind submission to the hierarchy by making obedience to authority the highest virtue. He also shines a light on the new theological errors popularized since Vatican II that glorify every type of sexual expression, including pedophilia. Did you get that? Even pedophilia is glorified by these theological, quote, errors popularized since Vatican II. Sacri the book Sacrilege will prove an essential resource for all those concerned with the history and future of Catholicism. I mentioned this other book. I'm not going to repeat it again. I'll just say the title, Sex, Priests, and Secret Codes, The Catholic Church's 2,000-Year Paper Trail of Sexual Abuse by three Roman Catholics, including a Roman Catholic priest, but Thomas P. Doyle, A.W. Richard Sipe, S-I-P-E, and Patrick J. Wall. That's a 388-page hardcover book. And uh, we had mentioned before this big book uh, by Randy Engels. I'm looking for it here. And uh, that, I can't believe the size of that book. That book's as thick as a Philadelphia phone book. Uh, of course, there's The Priest, The Woman, and The Confessional. You can get by Charles Chinnicky. Now, that's a, a little bit older book, but it's a great book. Um, okay, here it is. The Rite of Sodomy, Homosexual and homosexuality and the Roman Catholic Church. This lady's in my area. She's not very far away. She's a Pennsylvanian. Randy Engel. She wrote a 1,282-page paperback book published in Export, Pennsylvania. It's called The Rite of Sodomy, and I know that we talked about it before, but homosexuality and the Roman Catholic Church. Randy Engel, 1,282 pages. She's a Roman Catholic. And this is what the back cover is. Okay, back comment, was. comment, comment. Yep. Comment, comment. Okay. You know, all of this talk about priests and sexual abuse, it's the most disgusting, despicable thing on the face of the earth. And it makes people like me sick to death. And, and I just, you know, I just can't, it, it just... I, I can't wrap my brain around how perverted this subject is. It's just, it's beyond filth. It's, it's just, you know, this is one reason why videos like this you can't find. You can't find discussions on, on this topic because it's so damn filthy, no one wants to hear it. This is how bad Satan's polluted the earth. And how much longer, Lord, will this continue? We're all sick of it. That's a good point. And the, the reason that I think that uh, Yerk has covered this so well in uh, Dutch and German and in English, and that I'm bringing it up, is, is, that, is that these people skate by because of their dual citizenship, the dual citizenship that they have. So they're, the cover-up continues. And the, as the one person pro pointed out in uh, their book, is that, uh, that the main thing is the, the image. They want to protect the image of the church to the point where they ignore the victims. And we've got several victim groups around 
here in Pennsylvania, or they're active in Pennsylvania. They don't necess- Some of them are national, I believe, but SNAP, and that there's victims groups that are disgusted because the bishops, believe me, the bishops keep promising, oh, we're going to do something about it. Oh, believe me, we've, we've taken notice. Uh, believe me, we've, we've started reforms. But nothing changes. Nothing Despite changed. all of their talk, nothing changes. It's all just talk. Yep, that's right. It's just big talk. To get nothing to, can to, change because it is on the basis yes. of their religion. Mm-hmm. That's yep. why it is a systematic Roman Catholic child abuse. And I don't care for minors only. Every man, every woman on this earth that is abused by the Roman Catholic Church is a child of God. Every abuse is child abuse. Of course, it is so much harder when we are dealing with minors who cannot even defend themselves. But even older people, when they are being abused, cannot defend themselves. Because their defense is the Bible. Yes. And who, and who, let me ask you in all honesty, who really knows his Bible today? When you have a question, why don't you open up the Bible? Mm-hmm. The answer is found there. But people are going to psychologists, philosophers, doctors, professors, Whatever people are, they're standing in this world or in the church, turning to their priest or their bishop or whatever, seeking answers where they are not getting answers. The only answers that you can get in this question is in the Bible. And the Bible tells you very clearly in the last few chapters of the book of Revelation that the whore is reigning over the whole earth with the kings. And the whore is Babylon, is Rome. And the Roman Catholic Church is that Rome. And these abuses are infested in her from the roots. And we cannot take yep. out the roots. The Bible clearly says we have to be patient until our Lord Jesus Christ comes back. When he comes back the seventh, the second time, the seventh, I want to say, the second time, then he is going to destroy that Babylon religion with the sword of his mouth. That's the way it is written. What we can do in the meantime, and this is why I love to participate in these kind of talks, is put this information out there for people who do like an ostrich and put their head in the sand and don't want to hear it and don't want to see it and don't want to know it and let it pass all over their back. But that doesn't take away the atrocities and the abuses and persecution and everything else. We have to do something about it. We have to stand against it. We have to protest it. And that's what we are doing here. And that's why I hope that many people Mm -hmm. watch these videos and by this protest get up and wake up and pick up their Bible and read and study the truth so that they can conquer the lie with the truth in their hand. Put on the whole armor of God. Ephesians chapter 6 verses 10 through 18. And And speaking of Ephesians... With this, Speaking of this, go ahead. Yeah, with finished. this, I want to end, and then you can make your closing remarks because we have already gotten beyond the hour. Mm-hmm. And I right. think that is all that I wanted to say today. Read your Bible and open Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. But please, Daryl, no, it's your turn. Yeah, again. since you mentioned Ephesians, uh, and I don't have my Bible right handy right in front of me, but Ephesians 5.11, I believe that's one verse that I, I hope I have got memorized, and that is, uh, have no uh, fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. In other words, bring them to the light. Expose them. And uh, Ephesians 5.11 is a tremendous verse. I'm going to close with just a short paragraph, because here's another book I found, written by two courageous Roman Catholics. The one's dead, Jason Berry and Gerald Renner wrote a 353-page paperback book. I just found this book recently in one of my packed shipping crates. It's called Vows of Silence, The Abuse of Power in the Papacy of John Paul II. Let me repeat that. Vows of Silence, The Abuse of Power in the Papacy of John Paul II. In the back of the book, it's a very short paragraph. It says, Going deep behind the headlines about scandals in the Catholic Church, Jason Berry and Gerald Renner's, again, both Roman Catholics, Vow of Silence, the book Vow of Silence, follows the staggering trail 
of evasions and deceit that leads directly to the Vatican and taints the legacy of Pope John Paul II. This book was written back in 2004, but it's got a 2010 paperback edition by Simon & Schuster, a division of Simon & Schuster. Here's what it says. Based on more than six years of investigative reporting and hundreds of interviews, this book is a riveting account of Vatican cover-ups, both a profound criticism and a wake-up call to reform by two Catholic writers. The book Vows of Silence reveals an agenda of top down control under John Paul II, who they want to make a saint, by the way, and a hierarchy so obsessed with secrecy as to spawn disinformation. It is not a book about sexual abuse. It is a book about abuse of power throughout the Vatican. And so I would say to folks, do an internet search for that book, but I've got many good books here that we've mentioned that are, I believe every single one of them is written by Roman Catholic authors and they courageous Roman Catholic authors. And again, sometimes people die premature deaths for writing books as, as uh, did uh, uh, William H. Kennedy in Lucifer's Lodge. They believe he got a little speedy exit, premature exit from the, this world. But this is an, a big problem. It's not just big in my area, southwest central Pennsylvania. This problem is big wherever the Roman Catholic Church dominates. And again, we're not being mean to Roman Catholics. You, you need to, a bunch of more Roman Catholics like these courageous authors need to stand up and hold this church accountable, not just for the sexual abuse, but the cover-up of the sexual abuse and the protection of the guilty parties within the Roman Catholic Church, protecting these priests and prelates. And it goes all the way up to people like when he was uh, in uh, New York, Cardinal Spellman and that. So, yeah, we opened a, a can of worms here, but it's a, it's a, a subject that needs to be uh, investigated, and we urge people to check out these books by courageous Roman Catholic writers and authors and uh, find out and do your own investigation and take a look at how big this problem is, not just, again, amongst with young men and boys, but also, we, as William H. Kennedy said in his book, Lucifer's Lodge, he believes the abuse of women and girls is an even bigger problem. So good to be on with both of you again today and, and getting uh, good information out to folks so that they can do their own investigation. And thank you for the great work that you both of you do with the, the graphics and that on these uh, YouTubers, I call them YouTube recording sessions. The graphics are tremendous, and I'm glad you guys can do that. I can't. But uh, if I die a premature death, by the way, I'm 71, but my heart is super strong, and I can walk up uh, pretty steep hills even with my stroke side dragging me down, slowing me down. So if I die, you hear me having a heart attack. Uh, Something isn't kosher, folks, because I go up and down steep, Uh, steps every day and I go up and down steep hills every day so uh, my heart thank God is still pretty strong and I've only fallen twice Uh, once over uh, one of my plastic crates or a a plastic outdoor chair and once on pure solid ice in my driveway and hopefully those days of winter are over for a while and I can tell Yerk that I can see my grass now so he can't brag that he's the only one that can see his grass. So we do have a little bit of humor that we inject into these uh, YouTube sessions. So God bless you both, and thanks uh, for the great work that you do with the graphics. You're welcome, Daryl. Thank you, Yerk. Uh, thanks for uh, just delving into this subject. You know, um, it's uh, you know probably the worst subject mm-hmm. um, for uh, for myself. Uh, speaking for myself and on my YouTube channel here because, uh, yeah, I really despise sexual sin. I, uh, um, you know, it's not as if we have enough problems on our own, you know, in our lives. And then, you know, uh, you have to deal with, uh, the, uh, abuse of others. And, um, there's going to be a lot of of uh, sorrow, a lot of tears shed over this, and there already has been 
Uh, that's the point. Um, yeah, I mean, it's uh, <sighs> just one of those things that uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I just don't have any more words. So we'll catch up with you guys next time. God bless. Bye-bye. Since World War II, America has encouraged and benefited from the global advance of free markets, from the strength of democratic alliances, and from the advance of free societies. At one level, this has been a raw calculation of interest. The 20th century features some of the worst horrors of history because dictators committed them. With eyes now opened, look at yonder sight. Satan transformed, an angel of the light. His left hand holds a crucifix, his right a naked sword. What harmony in these, the quickened sense the adversary sees. Spite of disguises as the piercing eye of Jesus did the prince of hell descry. Hid in the form of Peter, so our gaze looks on the lie with anger and amaze. Rome is a hierarchy and means the reign. Through priests of the old enemy again. Two hundred millions of the sacred sway of the triple tyrant and his word obey. Upon them half a million priests with feet, audacious tread and tramp as seemeth meet. Upon the priests a thousand bishops climb and cluster on their shoulders while sublime. Above the bishop cardinals appear and over them the ruler of the sphere. The aged autocrat and close behind frowns the dark visage of the master mind. O form half seen, half hidden, black as night, and blood-stained, furtive, shrinking from the sight, slippery, unearthly, calculating, cold, the papal helm and scepter thou dost hold. Yes, thou! The vision startles men at times, and then recedes the mountain of thy crimes. Looms like a lurid Etna twixt the clouds, and while the world is gazing, darkness shrouds. The horror, and men think on it no more, yet there it is in fact as it was before. Satan himself beneath the sacred name of Jesus followers the loftiest claim, the purest doth advance, angel of light, his name is Jesuit or Jesuit. The company of Jesus, Satan's band, his own militia, his material hand, his heart of falsehood, his most subtle mind, his serpent shape while coil and coil doth wind. And in the folds, the fangs, the glittering eyes, God shall unearth thee. Yet thy sentence lies writ in his book. Yea, hast thou never read, the woman's seed shall bruise the serpent's head? He whose great name thou bearest, he shall crush thy hateful head. Go then, thy presence hush. Slip slyly into palaces and shrines. Sit in confessionals secret minds, plot, plan, pretend, dissemble, darken, lie. Heaven yet shall drag thee forth and lift thee high. And with its hand of might and holy ire, fling thee, foul serpent, in the eternal fire. O monster's pyramid, I see it rise. It seems to tower and touch the very skies. Man's lofty free morality is mute in the dread presence of the Absolute. The priest is in the place of the Most High, all must submit to his authority. Then in his turn the priest doth bend before the bishop, while the bishop doth adore the Pope, and he? Well, Satan doth inspire, Satan dark dressed in Jesuit's attire. And in that fraud, then he there is none higher. Victims of conspiracy, what's your pope? A mask, a mystery. The mouthpiece is another. Read and see the doctrines of the Jesuits who guide the papal judgment and unseen decide the voice of the infallible and read the story of their deeds. Take ye good heed. 
to whom your soul's salvation ye commit? Who is it that in truth does yonder sit? In the dark Vatican? See wheel and wheel how works the strange machine so with to which ye kneel, and how one name another doth conceal. Apostles guide not now, the church is dumb, the fathers dead and buried, conscience numb, the intellect, the soul have lost their eyes, Bibles are banned and wisdom only lies in one man's breast. And who is at his back? Ah, that's the question, only trace the track behind the papal chair, where to and fro it winds, and you shall meet with wonder, lo, another pope behind. the papal chair, where to and fro it winds, and you shall meet with wonder, lo, another pope behind the pope we know. You were both in Skull and Bone the Secret Society. It's so secret we can't talk about what it. What does that mean for America? The conspiracy theorists are going to go on. I'm sure they are. I don't know. I haven't seen the record. Number 322? <laughs> <laughs> uh, first of all, he's not the nominee. And, uh, but, uh, look, I look for... Are you prepared to lose? No, I'm not going to lose. Since World War II, America has encouraged and benefited from the global advance of free markets, from the strength of democratic alliances and from the advance of free societies. At one level, this has been a raw calculation of interest. The 20th century features some of the worst horrors of history because dictators committed them. If this were a dictatorship, it'd be a heck of a lot easier. <laughs> Just so long as I'm the dictator. 